Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno. On this episode, we will feature an in-depth conversation on trade and economic development at the border. But first, we introduce you to a local organization working to strengthen economic development and education in Las Cruces. For our segment, Community Connection, our producer, Christian Valle, takes us to Cruces Creatives. Cruces Creatives is Las Cruces' local makerspace where we empower the community through tools, space, and a community to make most anything. One of the first things you're going to find are our tools and our space. That'll include a dedicated kids' classroom, a room with textiles and multiple sewing and looming machines, dedicated electronics room, which I'm in right now, to be able to do all sorts of coding, electronics. We have 3D printers here, a laser cutter on site, and then also our wood shop and bicycle shop in the back. There are lots of ways to get involved. And one of the first ways is just coming in to use our tools and our space. And whether you're using that for a school project, a new skill that you want to learn, or you're wanting to start a new business, we have members here that do a little bit of all of that. And to get involved in that way, memberships are the way to go. Uh, memberships give you access to the facility. And there's two ways to actually get a membership. One is to have a paid membership. And two, we offer volunteering memberships. So if you come in and regularly volunteer with us, you can have a free membership. Oh, well, the wood shop is fun. I have fiddled around with wood for years, just doing stuff at home. Never had the equipment that we have here. There are people here that can help you out and show you the ropes and, and we've got a lot of equipment that you wouldn't run into um, anyplace else. It's enjoyable helping other people to do you know, what their projects are so they can succeed and they can, they can get things done and that keeps them coming back here to Cruces Creatives also. And it's worth your while coming down to see it. Um, we have a lot of opportunities for creating and that's what it's all about. We have dozens of events and classes and programs throughout each month, and anybody in the community is welcome to join. Additionally, you're welcome to donate tools, time, or funding. One of the great things about our space is that we're community-built and community-led, and a lot of the tools that we have here today were actually donations from our community. Cruces Creatives is located at 205 East Loman, and we're open on Tuesdays and Thursdays, 12 p.m. to 8 p.m., and Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. To be able to learn more about our programs, please visit our website at crucescreatives.org or visit us on Facebook or Instagram. And out of any of the impacts that I've seen out of Cruces Creatives is the ability of creativity to bring people together. We're all creative and it has a shared language where everybody can talk to one another. We now continue our program with an in-depth conversation on trade and economic development at the border. Joining us is Jerry Pacheco, president of the Border Industrial Association. Mr. Pacheco also serves as executive director of the International Business Accelerator, and he also pens the syndicated column Business Across the Border for the Albuquerque Journal. Jerry, thank you for taking the time to talk with us. My pleasure. Good to be with you, Anthony. Now, I'd like to give you an opportunity to share more about your group and how you're working to strengthen economic development and trade at the border. Can you share with us a little bit about the Border Industrial Association and the work you all are doing there? Yeah, uh, the Border Industrial Association is a 501c6 that represents the Santa Teresa industrial base. We're about 14 years old, have about 130 members. Uh, 
uh, obviously the manufacturing plants in Santa Teresa, the distribution centers, but also service providers that uh, are connected to the industrial base or members. We're the ad advocacy group for the Santa Teresa industrial base. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that Santa Teresa is not an incorporated municipality. We're part of the general county. So we have to, uh, we work really well with the county. But uh, we, we take care of little things, uh, everything from advising the county or the state that a sign is down uh, to working with all levels of government to ensure that we have infrastructure funding so we can keep this phenomenal growth down here. Uh, we also bring in suppliers. Uh, we try to spread the love throughout the state of New Mexico by, by bringing uh, to the attention of potential suppliers uh, supply opportunities here in Santa Teresa. So that's pretty much what the Border Industrial Association does. Well, there's been a lot of excitement at, at the border with the work you all are doing, uh, growing the economy there, bringing in jobs and businesses to the area. Can you share with us a little bit about recent growth at the border and why you are very excited about the efforts down there? Right now, we've never seen this much construction. We've got, uh, we're approaching 6 million square feet of space up here uh, in the Santa Teresa Industrial Base in the four industrial parks. We are 100% occupied. There is no leasable space available right now. It's the first time I've ever seen that happen in my 31 years of working here in this project. Uh, we do have um, some new buildings coming online. This, they're called speculative buildings. They're, that's when a developer builds a building, then goes and finds a tenant. So we've got one building at uh, 365,000 square feet that's uh, pretty much done. It's already leased out. Uh, we have another company building two buildings. Each of those buildings is 135,000 square feet. The first building will be ready uh, probably in January. They've already started the dirt work for the second building. And then we have another building at the border that's gonna be 120,000 square feet. Those are just spec buildings. We are also working with other leads in the value added agricultural uh, area. And then uh, on the other side of the border, Foxconn, which uh, is tied into our industrial base. They're making up to 70,000 Dell computers a day. Uh, they have a million and a half square feet. They broke ground about uh, 12 months ago on a 1.2 million square foot expansion. And then we have a, a gummy bear factory on the Mexican side of the border. Uh, they just opened last year. I think they, they're making something like 830,000 pounds of gummy bears every day. Uh, they are building a brand new building that's, that's bigger than the original one, 280,000 square feet. So those projects alone between the Mexican side and Santa Teresa are about 2.3 million square feet. Then we have another developer that did a land swap at the airport, the Santa Teresa airport. They're gonna be doing uh, two uh, buildings that will be the equivalent of 650,000 square feet. So once that gets going, we're gonna have almost 2.9 2 million, 2 million square feet under construction here of industrial space. So I would bet you that that's probably more industrial space than the entire state of New Mexico combined. That sounds very exciting. What do you think are the keys to keeping that growth continuing? Uh, three things, infrastructure, infrastructure, and infrastructure. Um, our motto is we, we have to keep infrastructure ahead of development. Uh, the day you can't flush your toilets is the day you don't recruit a new business into the parks here. So um, our water, wastewater system, which is in pretty good shape, we have to plan for the future and, and add to that before we reach our limits there. Uh, we, we work closely with El Paso Electric to make sure our electrical needs are, are there. The New Mexico Gas Company is a, a big partner. And these are all members, by the way, of the Border Industrial Association. And the state needs to keep uh, its foot on the pedal uh, through what's called the New Mexico Partnership, which is the, it's kind of a quasi-governmental agency that, that, that promotes New Mexico and recruits company to the state. So uh, the state needs to keep uh, its, its foot on uh, the recruitment uh, efforts, uh, which have been paying off in, in big time not only in Santa Teresa, but other areas in the state. Water has been a major concern for many in our region. How do you plan uh, in thinking about water when you're thinking about growth in the area there, in the uh, industrial area? How important is it to have a strategic plan for water? It's uh, paramount. Uh, we obviously live in a desert. Um, 
we're growing the economic development pie and more uh, people, the more uh, investment you bring in, the more uh, the water needs are going to be. So we work closely with our local water provider, the Camino Real Regional Utility Authority. We work with the legislature and the governor's office to make sure we have funding for water, wastewater projects. One of the things that's very exciting that we're, we've been working on five years with New Mexico State University and Elephant Butte Irrigation District is a desalinization plant. We literally here in Santa Teresa in the southern part of the county, we sit on a, a, a Lake Superior, if you will, of brackish water. And uh, we believe that um, sometime in the future, a desal plant is going to be viable. So with the NMSU folks, uh, we've been working, uh, providing information. They actually have a, a desal technology. They're testing at the K. Bailey Hutchinson plant in El Paso, which is the largest uh, inland uh, desal plant in the world. So uh, early next year, uh, NMSU hopes to write up a paper and a report and we can judge the viability, if not now, I bet you in the future, if we keep going into this extended drought, um, a desal plant down here is gonna make more and more sense. What are your thoughts on the port of entry in Santa Teresa and how does strategic planning around that port play a key role in growing business and economic development at the border? And I should have mentioned this earlier, the port is paramount to us. I mean. We have a port of entry that was opened in 1993. Uh, since then, uh, we've only added one lane at the port of entry and a, and a couple of um, uh, just improvements, nothing major. Uh, that port, when it, was, when it was open, was crossing less than 50 trucks a day. We're now uh, approaching 700 northbound trucks a day and about half of that southbound. Um, we still have the fastest, uh, port of entry in terms of commercial crossings. We work very well with the Customs and Border Protection staff down there that um, that are very keen in, in help, helping us develop uh, this, this region. But we are at the point where that port of entry needs to be modernized and expanded so we don't hit a bottleneck sometime in the future. So the state has a $500,000 grant to do uh, a design and engineering study on the modernization of the port. And we estimate it's going to take about $170 million uh, to, to expand in that port and, and uh, make it accommodate all the, the extra traffic we're generating here. We hope to, in the next couple of years, hopefully the next couple of years, knock on wood, uh, that we're going to be able to access that funding. Over the last year, uh, El Paso and the southern border uh, here in New Mexico has seen an influx of migrants seeking asylum in the area. Uh, now communities have been trying to adapt to this issue. How does this issue impact your mission? The, the biggest way it impacts our, our mission or our ability to, uh, to develop here is it, it's surprisingly what people don't know. I, when migrants come across the border, they often come in groups and they, they, they don't come generally violently. They come to a port of entry and say, I surrender, I'm requesting amnesty. So if you get a group of 20 or 30 uh, doing that or even 10, that takes a, a customs and border protection officer off of the line clearing commerce, clearing cargo, coming northbound. And that means we have one or several less uh, customs agents processing the uh, the uh, uh, the export the imports into the United States or the exports that means that uh, cargo could slow up it means that uh, the supply chain gets inefficient logistics get inefficient um, we have problems with migrants in in the industrial parks but it's never a violent problem it's it's simply they're coming up here they're north of the port of entry they're usually looking for um, a federal official, uh, official that they can surrender to. Uh, it hasn't been disruptive in that sense where they're, 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 they're running through the yards and stealing stuff and what have you. It's mostly the issue of them coming in groups and then our customs officers have to attend to them. They have to register them, do a metal, medical check, they have to feed them. All of this stuff uh, becomes disruptive to trade. Now that's obviously, there's some humanitarian concerns to consider with this issue that's going on. Um, when policymakers come down and talk with you, do they bring up this issue? 
Yeah, they 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 usually do. Um, they ask exactly what you asked: is it is it affecting you? Well, it affects everybody uh, in in this region to a certain extent. Um, for us, it's time lost at the port of entry mostly, um, and a lot of our businesses up here are are tied to a global su supply chain. They have to keep certain security um, efforts. Uh, they have to be vigilant at all time. Um, all, all times and so when you have let's say people coming in um, it makes a lot of people nervous uh, you don't see them literally running down the roads okay it's not that situation and I don't want anybody north of our region to, to take what I'm saying and saying see it's it's out of control it's out of control well it is out of control to a certain extent but it's not a question that I'm afraid to go to my car in my parking lot or I've seen even any migrants in my parking lot what have you it's not that usually they are surrendering at the port of entries before they even come five miles north for my offices north of the port of entry there's been reporting in 2022 the state of texas lost a billion dollars a week during texas governor greg abbott's extra inspections at the border at the time the governor said the move was to crack down on drugs and human trafficking. Um, critics say the governor was using the border for political reasons. I'd like to get your thoughts on this action and how it may impact trade and economic development at the border. Well, first thing I'm going to do this Christmas is get a big, big gift basket and send it to Austin uh, for what the Governor Abbott did for us at the port of entry in Santa Teresa. And I, I'm joking. Um, what happened was uh, the governor decreed that his Department of Public Safety would have to conduct secondary inspections of northbound cargo. Well, Customs and Border Protection already does that. They have x-ray machines, they have personnel, they have dogs, they have experts. So by the time a truck goes northbound, it's pretty much inspected. Um, those of us in trade thought that those secondaries, uh, secondary inspections were a political tool, superfluous, if you will, because all that did was it disrupted uh, the logistics chain, caused uh, trucks northbound into El Paso to wait up to 16 hours to cross. You had literally drivers sleeping in their cabs or having another a driver replace them to sleep in the cab. What that did for us, Anthony, in New Mexico was, was very interesting. It pushed a lot of traffic from the El Paso uh, commercial ports of entry to Santa Teresa to cross northbound. Um, and what happened was interesting. A lot of uh, companies that were not crossing at Santa Teresa uh, started crossing here and they said, oh my goodness, it's not taking us hours and hours to cross. We're crossing Santa Teresa in 30 minutes northbound. Why aren't we doing this? Or why didn't we do this in the past? And then there were other firms that were very angry at the state of Texas that said, I'm not going to cross in El Paso anymore. I'm going to go through New Mexico. They don't do this over there. So our traffic went up significantly. I've seen um, uh, some kind of um, studies and I've talked to people that say they, they went up uh, by 20 percent or more during that period of time. And then a lot of it stuck. A lot of it kept coming through Santa Teresa. So anytime that the state of Texas does that, we tend to benefit. And a lot of people would ask, well, what, does, what difference does that make that you're crossing more trucks, more trucks on our roads? The more trucks you cross at a port of entry, the higher you, you go up on the list, uh, the more love you get from Washington in terms of federal funding for things like expanding the port of entry, new roads, infrastructure. So it behooves us to keep increasing the traffic at the port of entry. What did that move by the Texas governor and the disagreements between the Texas governor and Mexico, uh, how did that impact your relationship, New Mexico's relationship with Mexico and possible future it, trade deals? It made more uh, New Mexico more prominent in the discussion because uh, it made a lot of the um, uh, Mexican officials realize that they needed an alternative reliever route to move traffic northbound. 
And a lot of that was due to the pressure that manufacturers in Mexico were were putting on the Mexican government to do something about the Texas situation. So uh, my hat's off to the the men and women at Customs and Border Protection and the officials at the port of entry uh, that support them there. They really bent over backwards to accommodate traffic. We usually don't um, clear traffic on Saturdays. We've kind of adjusted the hours at the port of entry to maximize the traffic during the week, but they even opened up traffic northbound on Saturdays to accommodate uh, those imports into the United States. So it made New Mexico a more prominent player uh, on the border and uh, a viable option. I think we were tested as as an option and we came through uh, uh, with flying colors. Now, lawmakers in New Mexico may be excited this year when they're trying to craft the state budget because there's been reports of the state having an influx of cash for the upcoming fiscal year. What would you like policymakers in Santa Fe to consider uh, to continue the future growth in your area in this upcoming fiscal year? Obviously, infrastructure. uh water wastewater projects um, improvement and expansion of that system um, we have a uh, an at grade crossing where the union pacific uh, railroad goes across two of our industrial parks creates a safety hazard it creates a logistical mess because the train if it's crossing there or parked there splits two industrial parks so the county to its credit has received some initial funding to do an engineering study on that. And then we need to go out and get money to do the overpass. But then we also need overpasses on the busiest intersections on the Pete Dominici Highway. We wanna maintain that highway from the port of entry to I-10 in West El Paso as a thoroughfare, not a place where you're going uh, every mile and stopping at a stoplight. So we have three major intersections Uh, between the port of entry and the Texas state line. Uh, We need that. Uh, If the desalinization plant uh, proves to be viable, we're going to have to work with the state uh, to uh, seek funding either federally or if the state has funding locally, which we all know this year is, uh, I've been told uh, the monies that that are available for infrastructure projects are generational this year. Um, Plus supporting the port of entry, just getting that going so we can modernize it. But the state already has done so much. Uh, Between the special session last December and the uh, regular session January and February of 2022, we've gotten about $81 million for uh, projects like the airport. We're also gonna construct um, an extension of a road called St. Francis that is down by the port of entry and it parallels the border we're going to take it off, off of the escarpment in Santa Teresa and run it down into Sunland Park and connect to the border highway in El Paso. That's big time. That opens up uh, a, a reliever route, not only for cargo going eastbound or coming westbound, but for people that want to work in Santa Teresa and service providers. So we've been really happy with the state and what they've done, but there's always more. And if we're going to continue this major economic development project, We've got to um, look to the future and we've got to keep receiving that funding. Jerry Pacheco is president of the Border Industrial Association. Jerry, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Good to be here, Anthony. Thank you very much. Moving on, we now meet a local artist, author and filmmaker who produces works that feature portraiture, landscapes, wildlife and Western culture. On this segment of Living Here, we bring you more from our producer, Christian Valle, who highlights the artwork of Ed Breeding. The medium, I've worked in oil and acrylic. I'm pretty hyper. So acrylic works better with my personality. It dries very quickly. You gotta get on the ball, boom, 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 or it's dried. The genre, I do portraiture, I do landscape, I do a Western, a lot of wildlife. Each season, I produce 30 to 40 paintings, just that one season. But like I said, I'm focused. I've learned to get something done, focus your energy like a laser beam. What I would like for them to take away, if they're able, is to see the spiritual side of the paintings, that there is a spiritual dimension and a lot of people that has observed my paintings deeply, they have seen that. 
I'm very indigenous in my thinking. A creator a spirit is in all of creation, not just in humans. And I firmly believe that. I've learned in life about the theory of detachment. Life is a journey and we all have to go carry a certain amount of quote unquote baggage. But I've learned to fulfill the journey, detach from as much baggage as possible. So when I'm painting, there's no baggage at all. I'm completely absorbed in it. I'm lost in it. I become the animals, the landscape, the sky, and that is the experience. I know it's been at least a thousand or more paintings. Uh, films, I've done uh, I think 16 now documentary films. Uh, books, I've uh, with the latest book that I've just uh, published on Amazon, Paintings of a Lifetime is the name of it. That, I think that makes 13 books that I've published. Right now, there's the only one place I have online, it's called fineartamerica.com. I have probably 75 or 100 images on there that they can see. Anyone that wants to friend me, interesting, on Facebook, I'm constantly posting paintings on Facebook. And then locally, the gallery up in Alamogordo, uh, New York Art and Music, they have about 30 of my paintings on display. First and foremost, I would tell them, <clears throat> be true to yourself. Don't attempt to imitate anyone else because we're all fantastic within ourselves. No one's better than us. And you as an artist, Jim, Joe, whatever your name is, realize the power you have inside of you and honor that first and foremost, and you'll do well. That's it for this week's episode. You can view past episodes of Fronteras at Changing America by visiting our website, krwg.org, or you can stay updated with the news anytime. Thank you for joining us this week. I'm Anthony Moreno. We'll see you next time.